If you were with us last week, we started a brand new series called You Asked For It. Uh, this is a series where we're just taking some questions from the congregation. Uh, a few months ago, we started a couple months ago where you guys were sending these in, and we're going to answer as many of them as we possibly can. Last week, Pastor Josh jumped up and he talked about abuse in the church. That was a big question that was asked, and we felt it was so necessary to jump into that. Um, and it was a great message. If you ha- didn't listen to it last week, Really encourage you to. I think there's some good healing, that the Lord has some healing uh, for people who have been in those churches, been in those situations at, in a church, uh, and just dealt with that kind of abuse before, um, for some healing and for some restoration and all the things that God has. So encourage you to go back and listen to that. But we're going to continue moving on this week, and uh, we've got a completely different topic today. Uh, and so it's, it's a whole new thing. That's what this series is. It's a bunch of random things is what it feels like. Um, but we are going to talk today about heaven and hell. So... This is something we get every year, guys. It's like every year we're like, oh, you asked for it. Send us in questions. Every single year, people are like, tell me about heaven. You know what I mean? I want to know about eternity or tell me about hell, right? It's like, and this year, this is the first one for me to come up and talk about this, but just the discussion of, hey, what does eternity look like? What's all this? What does scripture say about these things? And so we're going to dive into that today. And I think it's totally understandable. It makes sense that these are questions we get every year because uh, heaven and hell are, are, when, if we're being honest, things that there's a lot of different ideas and beliefs about. Amen? People have different opinions on, hey, here's what heaven looks like. Here's who goes to hell or who goes to heaven. And, you know, there's denominations that believe differently. All kinds of different things that we've all probably heard while growing up in the church or just around in the world. And so it is important that these conversations are in God's word. And we may not have every answer. And I can promise you today you won't walk out with every answer on heaven or hell. But we can dig into some truth, amen, and see what the Lord's word says and hopefully bring some clarity to all of it. And so I figured to start out, why not just jump in and start answering some of the questions. I ultimately have one that I really want to spend some time on, but I want to answer some other questions about heaven and hell. So the first question we're going to start out with, if you've got notes, we're going to take them right now. Uh, Will people who lived before Jesus be in heaven? This is something I always thought about, you know, growing up and I was like, hold on, well, those other people, you know what I mean? There's a second Half of the book, Jesus is here. First one, what about them? It's like, you're born too early. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. It's like, what does that look like? And so diving into that and be like, Lord, what's the process here? And so I want to take you to Hebrews 11, uh, verses 13 through 16. This passage right here is actually discussing some of the heroes of the faith in the Old Testament. So here's what it says, starting in verse 13. All of these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own home or call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So again, this is the author of Hebrews who we don't actually know who the author of Hebrews is, but this person who's writing this, they're coming in and they're talking about these heroes of the faith again, and they're describing them. And in the passages above this in chapter 11 in Hebrews, it mentions the faith of Abraham, the faith of Sarah, of Enoch, of Noah, of Abel, of all these people who had that very strong faith in the Lord. They trusted God with all that they were. They were imperfect, but they trusted the Lord. They believed that the promises that God had given in the very beginning were going to hold true. And so that's what the writer of Hebrews is showing us is these people, while they were on earth, God made promises for, for things now and got them to, to homelands there on the planet, on planet earth in their life. But also God promised eternity in the future. God had a promise of a heavenly home for them that they would one day get to experience, right? Just like all of us will, when we enter into this relationship with Jesus, we're given the promise of an eternity with God forever, And so we look back at this and what we see is that God's people, God's Israel, the people who chose to be followers of the Lord in the Old Testament and before Jesus, they're promised this heavenly eternity as well. Another example we can take that actually really just pushes this home for us is uh, 2 Samuel. There's this moment, uh, and we talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago, but David and Bathsheba's son um, was, got ill and was going to die. Uh, David just torn by that, he began to, uh, to just ask God and fast and beg God and just, just weep for days on end, asking God, please don't let my son die. Begging and begging him. It turns out that in the story that his son does pass away. And you know, people see David, they're like, he's distraught and he's distraught before his son passed away and it didn't happen the way he'd hoped it would. We, can ima- we can't imagine how he's going to be afterwards. He's probably going to lose his mind. You know what I mean? That his son didn't make it. And so what happens instead is, is David 
after he finds out his son has passed away, he gets up, he goes and cleans himself up, and he just gets kind of back on to being king of Israel, just moves forward. And it's like, they're like, yo, <laughs> what's wrong with David, right? And so they ask him, like, how are you not just gone? You were just begging and weeping and, and, and fasting and all this stuff and asking God to keep your son alive. And here's what David says in 2 Samuel. He says, but why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? No, I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. So all that to say that last part right there where David's like, hey, again, Old Testament, he's back here before Jesus. He's like, hey, just so you know, when somebody leaves me, when my child left me, I'm not concerned about him coming back to me because I know that God has given me a promise as his person, as his child, that one day I'll go see my son again. One day I will spend eternity with him. Do you see that? So it's God's chosen people, his Israel, they're going to be like, hey, we, get, we were here, but God promised this, us, promised this to us from the beginning as his people that we would spend eternity as well with the rest of us. So a side note on that too, I just think it's encouraging for people to hear this and to know this. Um, so there's, there's this moment with David and his son. Uh, we believe, and this leads us to believe, that um, any baby, any baby that passes um, and go, uh, early on, that they go to be with the Lord as well. So that's, and that's, you know, just something I think is, is important and encouraging to, to think about and to, to read here and to take from it um, because that's a very heavy loss to lose your child, to lose your baby. And David's words, which I believe the Lord totally used and worked through him with, it's like he's reminding us, hey, we serve a good and gracious and kind God. And he's like, hey, you're experiencing this loss, but don't you forget, you will see them again one day. You will be with them again one day. I've got them. They're in the best place possible now. And so um, I just think it's, it's an important thing to dig into that and realize that our babies, our sweet babies, get to go with him. Uh, so that's question number one. Again, we will see those people, God's chosen people, who were there before Jesus, just time frame-wise, on earth in eternity. The second thing, second question, when we go to heaven, Will we know our loved ones? Some of you are like, please, God, no. No, I'm just kidding. It's like, please. Do in-laws count? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I love my in-laws. Miss Anna, I love you. All right. So some context on what we're about to read in 1 Samuel. Uh, we don't know, okay? Just first off, we don't know every detail. We don't know how it all works out. Uh, and what memories we're going to keep, like all the details of it yet. But we do have this moment that leads us to believe that the answer is yes, that we will remember and know our loved ones. So this is 1 Samuel 28, and just a little background on what's going on here. So we've got King Saul, right? Saul was the king before uh, David, and David was anointed to become king. Well, Saul's kind of on his way out. So if you don't know the story, Saul has just done a lot of things wrong in the sight of the Lord. He's just disobeyed the commands that God had given him as king and gone his own way instead of God's way. And so God's like, hey man, uh, I've placed this anointing on you as king. I'm now removing that from you. And David will be the next king. I've anointed David already to be the king of Israel. And so Saul's just in this place. And if you read through these passages in 2 Samuel and stuff, and even in the, in, the, in the King's books, you see that he's just kind of scrambling around, like, like nothing, throwing spears at people, just frustrated, trying to kill David like eight times. And it's just like, the dude is struggling real hard, right? Well, he has another moment here where the Philistines are coming to attack Israel. And he's like, oh no, like the Philistine army is huge and they're going to destroy us. I need the help of the Lord, right? So he's asking God himself, going to prophets and asking, can you speak to God? Ask him to speak back. We need his help. I need to hear from the Lord on this, what we're supposed to do. And he's getting nothing, right? Because again, the Lord's like, hey man, you've already stepped so far this way. It's like, you've chosen to do your own thing. That's how it's going to be right now. And so Saul's like, okay, well, I need to figure something out. One thing that Saul did while he was king is he er like just eradicated every potential space or, or, or idea of people being able to go and talk to mediums. So mediums are people that could talk to spirits, people that were dead already. And it's like all that stuff led to a lot of different uh, idols and beliefs and stuff. And Saul was like, we need to get rid of that. It's not of the Lord. So he eradicated all that. But then he's in this spot right here at the Philistines and being scared. And he's like, well, I can't hear from the Lord myself. The prophets can't hear from him. God's not speaking to me. It feels like he's abandoned me. So I'm going to go find a medium, right? So it's just going to go to what he said no to. He does that, finds this medium, and is like, I need to talk to Samuel. She's like, okay. So she brings up Samuel. She's like, you know, I can get in trouble because Saul said no. He's like, don't worry, you won't get in trouble. He's disguised, all this kind of stuff. Brings up Samuel. The girl's like, wait, you're Saul. And he's like, it's okay. It's a fun, just a weird thing. But anyways, he brings Samuel back from the dead and begins to talk to him. And here's how it goes in 1 Samuel 28. So Samuel starts in verse 15 and he says, why have you disturbed me by calling me back? Samuel asks Saul. That's fantastic. You know what I mean? He's like, bro, 
I'm out here in Paradiso, you know what I mean? I'm sleeping, and you're going to call me back to this place? You know what I mean? Like, what, are, what, what is wrong with you? Just imagine being on, like, the best vacation of your life, and you get a call from work. You're like, dude, come on, dude. Not answer, you know? It's like, this is not, not going to happen. So this moment happens. He's like, why have you disturbed me? That's what Samuel says to Saul. Because I'm in deep trouble, Saul replied. The Philistines are at war with me, and God has left me and won't reply by prophets or dreams. So I have called for you to tell me what to do. But Samuel replied, why ask me, since the Lord has left you and has become your enemy? The Lord has done just as he said he would. He has torn the kingdom from you and given it to your rival, David. So here's what we get from this jar question. Do we remember those loved ones? Will we know them when we're in heaven? Again, we believe the answer is yes, because we see here, Samuel remembers Saul. Samuel is gone, right? He's passed away and he knows Saul. He sees him, he knows him. And not only does he know him and who he is, but he recounts things that happened while he was alive on earth with Saul. He recounts the fact that God had removed that anointing, right? That God was placing David as the king. That David was the next anointed king. He knows all these things and he remembers the relationship that he had with Saul and the things that God did while he was on earth around Saul. So again, we believe it to be that way, that it will be something that we, or we will have loved ones and we will know them, right? Again, we don't know every detail of the memory. Um, what, when I was thinking through this, one of the pictures that God kept popping up in my mind uh, was a couple years ago, Rachel and the kids and I, we got to go to Arizona to see my family and my sister was having a baby shower and the baby shower kind of turned into like a family reunion, but it was like such a beautiful thing. Like we got to all just spend time together. I'd seen people I hadn't seen for years and we just got to catch up and be like, oh, you're here. Like you're here. Wow, great. And just have great conversation and connect and have fun and laugh. And it was just so full. Have you had one of those experiences before? It's like, this is just a beautiful thing. That's, that's kind of how I picture these things. When we're gonna remember our people in heaven, these relationships we had here on earth, and we're gonna go, oh, you're here. <laughs> Let's go. Maybe not super surprised, but I'm glad you're here. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm glad you're here. This is great. You know, like celebration, family reunion. It's gonna be fantastic, right? Our relationships will probably look different. There's passages in scripture that, that show that we no longer need each other the, maybe, the way we maybe need each other here on earth. We don't rely on that way. The connection between husband and wife will look different. We're no longer husband and wife, but maybe instead we're just God's kids. And we get to worship the Lord and be in his presence and hang out with one another for eternity. Just complete. Amen? It's this really cool picture. So, again, do we think we'll know our loved ones? Will we know them, remember them? I believe we will. Don't know all the details, but I believe we will. Third question, what does the Bible say about hell? Right turn, <laughs> real quick, from family reunion to hell. Some of you are like, what's the difference? No. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. Family and forgiveness message coming to a church near you real soon, folks. We're going <laughs> to change things up. All right. So here's, here's the reality, Okay. People have a lot of different opinions and ideas, again, like we said at the beginning, on hell. Like different denominations, different beliefs, different things we were taught growing up. There's a lot of different concepts. And the truth is, is like compared to heaven, there's not as much in scripture um, when it comes to hell. But I do want to look at a few pieces in different, in different books of the Bible where um, people are referencing and talking about hell and what it will be like. Uh, and so the first one, uh, in the book of Matthew, we have Jesus make a few different references, first in chapter 8 and then in chapter 25. We're going to have this up right here. Yeah, so in, in, in chapter 8, in the book of Matthew, G Jesus references hell uh, as a place of outer darkness, right? And he says, and in this place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not cool, right? And then in chapter 25, Jesus also references it in verse 46, 41 and 46 as eternal fire and eternal punishment. So we get a really dark uh, and dangerous and fiery punishment from Jesus and Matthew in regards to what hell will be like. And then in Luke, Jesus tells a parable. And in this parable, he's talking about two men, uh, Lazarus and a rich man. And the rich man is in torment is what it says. The rich man is in Hades in torment. And so Jesus compares Hades, hell, to a place of torment at that time. And then Revelation, which is the last one, and we're going to take a deeper look at this, um, it talks more about death and Hades. This is what it says, Revelation 20, 14 through 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Three times lake of fire. <laughs> so, 
just really quick, wanted to take more time and read that whole passage um, compared to Matthew and Luke because I think it gives us more detail to dig into all this. So again, we get all those things, outer darkness, gnashing of teeth, eternal fire, eternal punishment, torment. And then here in Revelation, in this passage where it's talking about eternity and the day of judgment and what that's going to be like and people after judgment being thrown in the lake of fire, it says death and Hades. So first thing I want to look at is death and Hades. Primarily in scripture, and we're in class now, folks. I'm learning too, so come on. Uh, the Bible uses three words when it refers to hell. The first two are Sheol and Hades, okay? Sheol and Hades. Sheol is a Hebrew word. It comes from the Hebrew language, and Hades is a Greek word. The root is from Greek, and they are seen as generally similar ideas in Scripture. They both are used to describe the world beyond, right? They both are, are, are used to describe a place of the dead, but ultimately, they just stand for death, for the grave, when people die here on earth, they're in Sheol or they go to Hades. They're, they're in this place of the dead. They're in the grave. So that may just seem like simple and like, oh, that's not a terrible thing. But we know, just like we read in Revelation, death is not the Lord. Amen? Because in the end, death will be thrown into the lake of fire. Because as followers of Jesus, we are given eternal life. Death is no longer a thing. It no longer has a sting. It no longer has power. It is gone forever. But we see here people who were not in that relationship with the Lord, as well as death and Hades, will be thrown into the lake of fire. So again, these just basically mean the grave. We don't know much about uh, whether they're going to be places of, of torment or torture. If those, those other passages we were before, if they're talking about them. But again, in Luke, in the parable Jesus is telling, so again, he's telling a story. Jesus refers to Hades. And he says the rich man in the story is in Hades, right? And he's in torment. So people go back and forth. Theologians like kind of disagree on some of this because some are like, well, Jesus is just telling a story. We don't actually know if up front it's like a place of torment. And others are like, yeah, but that's Jesus. And he's, he's given us some insight through this parable. Like this is not good, y'all. You know what I'm saying? So he digs in and says that, but we don't know for sure, but Sheol and Hades. So those are the first two or two places that we see about, uh, in, in reference to hell. And the third one that we see when, when scripture is talking about hell is a word Gehenna or Gena is another way it's pronounced. And this is also a Hebrew word. And this actually originates, the, the word originates and is, was used to describe a place outside of Jerusalem's city walls. And this was a place where people would go and they would worship other gods. They would worship idols and they would make sacrifices. They would make human sacrifices, sacrifices of children, really terrible and dark stuff, guys. They would do really wrong things outside in this place. It was a place where they would burn garbage and trash and like it was just dark. So Death, brokenness, fire, all these things, the worship of other gods, idols, all this stuff happening in this, again, in this place it's talking about. And we believe that it was used because it's also referenced again in different places as the, a figure of speech to talk about eternal hell. It's like, hey, if there's a place that's gonna be a good picture of what hell's probably gonna look like, check that place out. And that's what's being used here is, hey, this is, this is the lake of fire. This is a picture of what eternal hell, for those who don't make the choice to make Jesus Lord of their lives, who aren't in that relationship, who decide to turn away from the Lord, and those who are death and and Hades, this is what it's going to be like there, right? So it gives us that idea, that picture. Again, we don't know every single detail, but we do know it does not sound great. And let me say this too. It talks about first death and the second death, right? In that passage in, in Revelation, it says that this is the second death, the lake of fire. So if you were with us last year, okay, we did a, we did you asked for it as well. And I got the, the privilege to speak about just heaven in general. And, and we talked about the fact that there are different heavens. And you're like, what are you talking about, man? There's, so you, technically there's three. If you want to get real technical, there's three. There's the sky, there's space, there's all that. But then there's heaven now, which the thief on the cross with Jesus, we remember that. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise, right? And so Jesus is saying, hey, when somebody passes away now, they go to paradiso, right? They go to heaven. They get to be with me. And and what we know about paradiso is it's a garden. We we see that in that passage in the translation of the word. And it's like, and then afterwards, the the third heaven or the second in actual heavens is the new heaven, new earth that God is bringing with the new Jerusalem, his new kingdom here, right? That is what we see. The same concept of one and two, there's, there's now and then it applies to hell is what we see. That there's a place, there's the grave now, there's death, there's Hades, there's Sheol. And it's like, and then afterwards for eternity, the eternal punishment is the lake of fire. So it's just that, that two-step kind of thing. There are two places just like it is for heaven. How are we doing, folks? 
It's not, it's not the most fun, right? Some of you are covering your kids' ears. I'm sorry, this is good. I have one more verse to read about hell for you, okay? And this is uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.9. So again, in reference to those who turn away from the Lord, this is what it says, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, they will be punished with eternal destruction. Again, eternal brokenness, eternal destruction. And here it is, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. So I think it's easy for us. We read these passages and again, we, we don't have a lot of, we don't, we don't have actual facts, but we, sometimes we like to think we know for sure. And again, people disagree. Here's what hell's like. Here's what's gonna be 100%, this, 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 this. I think it's dangerous to get caught up in that stuff. I think the biggest thing when we have a discussion like this that we should walk away from is the last part of this verse, that in hell, the most important thing to see is that we will be forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Yeah. That should be it. That should be enough for us to go, uh-uh. Forever separated from our God who is good, who is kind, who is gracious and forgiving and who is love, who cares and provides and all these things, who heals, gone forever. That's the biggest picture of hell. That should be enough to go, no, <laughs> right? That's, that's what we should really take away from it. We, it's easy to get caught up on the fire and the darkness. And you're like, oh, the torture. I don't, know, I don't know what torment, what is this? And sometimes we get super dark with it and we twist it into other things. Like we, we don't really know for, sh- for sure, but just know being away from the Lord forever. That should be enough, right? So even though there's a lot of disagreeing ideas, I think we can agree on two big things right here. What's hell like? Not good, right? That's first. Amen. And two, it's not good because we're separated from God forever. We're away from him and what he has with him is all the good, all the healing, all the stuff that we need, his glorious power. So this actually leads into our last question, okay? So we're done there with hell, okay? We're done digging through all that, but we have one more question that we're gonna, we're gonna look through that somebody had asked and I think it's super important because it helps actually bring that Second Th- Thessalonians verse uh, into a different context as well. So the question is, the last one is, how can heaven be good in a place of only happiness if I know some of my loved ones won't be there? That's a hard question. I, when I read that, I was like, whew, I feel that. I don't know about you guys, but I think that, I think, if we're being honest, I think that's a question that's on the heart of a lot of us way more often than we would probably admit. So we think of people we love and we're like, you know, I, I really don't know where they are. I don't know how they feel about Jesus and church and all these things. And man, but I wish they would, I wish they would believe. I wish they would see what God has shown me. I wish they knew that Jesus loves them more than they can understand or imagine, Right? This, the question like this, it breaks your heart. Because all we want, one, because we love our people, right? We love them and we want them to know that they are so loved by God. But the hard piece is, is we can't force that. We can't force it and Jesus won't, right? Jesus will not. We can talk to them all day long and be like, the word, you know what I mean? Like, come on, God loves you. And you're like, stop screaming. It's like, you're not helping. And Jesus, he definitely won't even get into that. He will pursue them, no doubt. Jesus, we we get pursued, church. I hope you know that. Jesus comes after us. He's not waiting and like, come on. You know what I mean? He's like, come, I'm here. I'm here. I'm right here. I love you so much. It is his heart's desire to spend eternity with every single one of us, to save every single one of us. He pursues us. But while he pursues, he does not force. He gives us choice. He says, I'm here and the door is open. You can come on in, but you don't have to. No matter what, I'll love you, but you don't have to. That's the heart of our savior for us. So when we look at all that, it's just challenging. So what is the answer to this kind of question, this very hard question of how can heaven be this good place if we know that some of our loved ones won't be there? I believe that God does give us an answer because he is a good God who cares for us. This comes from Revelation 21, verses three and four. Again, this is taking place uh, with John after judgment. And it's, it's just this beautiful thing of heaven, the new heaven being here and God's plan for it. So verse three, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, 
God's home is now among his people. Hear this. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. That's huge. Verse four, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Can I read that again? All these things are gone forever. That is the heart of the Father. That in the end, when we go to spend eternity with him, he's going to bring all the healing that we need. He's going to bring all the restoration that we need. He is going to bring us to whole, okay? We will be at wholeness in the presence of the Lord. We will be right there with him forever. So wait, wait, are you telling me that God just wants to come in? He's just like, he's gonna flip a switch and just tell me to stop caring? Like, just toughen up. You'll be okay. Like, no, 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 no. I believe that God cares so much that he understands when our heart breaks for those people that we love that might not be there with us in eternity. There's another passage in scripture where it talks, and we've referenced this before, but God, we see that God says, hey, I keep your tears in a jar. Every tear you shed, it matters to me, so I hold on to it, right? Because he, our pain, it matters to him. He doesn't want to just sweep it on the rug and say, get over it, toughen up. That's, that's, that's old news. No, no, no. He understands, and he loves us so much. He's like, I don't want you to stay in that broken spot forever. I want to heal your heart. I want you to experience the full joy that I have for you here in eternity. He brings the healing. He brings completion. Here's another way to look at it. So Rachel and I are huge fans of like home improvement stuff, man. Like we love HGTV. Come on. You know what I'm saying? Like we love watching stuff. We, we ourselves are getting more handy. Rachel's got the, like the eye to make everything look beautiful. I'm just saying. And then, you know, I'm pretty good. I can use a drill. Um, and <laughs> we're learning, <laughs> but we, we love it. Like, it's great. And if you've watched these shows, you know, remember Extreme Home Makeover, and now you got Fixer Upper, and you got Chip and Joanna Gaines, right? All these things. And it's like, you watch the show because in the human heart, we have a desire to watch things be restored. We have this deep desire to go, look at that broken thing, nasty as heck. You know what I mean? And at the end, they're like, are you ready to see? And you're like watching, you're like, yes! You know what I mean? Like, you're like, I can't wait! Move it! And they do, and you're like, this is crazy. You know what I mean? Like, we're more shocked than the people who bought the house. Like, I'm like, why are you guys not screaming? This is so good. We want that. As human beings, we, we love that. Our heart is for the process of restoration, watching broken and bad and, and nasty and, and, and lost things be found and made new and whole and complete and restored. That's what Jesus wants to do for us. This whole process or this whole relationship here on earth, when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, he goes, let's go to work. It's time to clean some stuff out. This part of your life, the bathroom, it's gutted. We're down to the studs, right? Right? And we're going to clean it out and we're going to make it brand new. That's what Jesus is doing inside of us. And he does that our whole life. He's just working, working, working. And we've got to get up every day and say, I surrender, I surrender, I surrender. I'm yours. Do what you got to do, Lord, right? Because he knows what's best. He's going to make it what's best. We had this conversation before first service and David Weiss, one of the guys who plays on the worship team here, he said this really cool thing. He was like, yeah, he's like, when, when, when God comes in, it's like, and he's, or when, when people are working on that house, it's like God working on us because the people working on the house, we pay them because they know what's best. We trust them in that process to do what they need to do. We should trust God the same way and go, you know how to make this exactly what it needs to be. Way better than I ever will. That's what he's doing. And then we see here, back to Revelation, that what he does is he gets us to that moment in eternity where he's like, are you ready to see the new you? Are you ready to experience the completion of what I've been doing this whole time to be brought to ultimate healing, complete healing, complete restoration? Because that was my plan. That's what I've been doing. And he reveals it to us. Now, we don't know exactly if it's something that happens again. Like we don't know if we, like the moment we, we step into eternity with God, if it's like, boom, just everything's perfect. Like our heart doesn't break for those things anymore. I, we don't know. It could be a process, truthfully. It could be, and a process isn't a bad thing. That doesn't mean that there's sin or brokenness in heaven. It means that there's good things, that we're with a heavenly father who's healing us and taking care of us, doing good things for us, right? We don't know exactly what it looks like, but we do have this promise, this absolute promise that it will happen, that there will be a day in eternity where we look back and go, I'm whole. 
God has completely healed my broken heart. The sorrow I felt for the things of the past, for those of the past, I feel no more, not because there's not care, but because there's ultimate healing. Do you hear that today, church? God wants to restore us, the whole process, all of it, and he brings it to completion, perfection. All right, so what do we do with all this, okay? Because this is like, this is a lot, right? And you're talking about heaven and hell, and sometimes you're like, oh, this is a message on heaven and hell. I already know, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, what am I gonna get from this? What do I take home with all this? I got two things, actually, because I think there is something here that we should take home, a couple things. First one is just something God had kept laying on my heart when I was prepping for, for this message, um, and it's, it's just to be okay with the unknown. These conversations, again, there is a lot of unknown. And sometimes that's totally okay. Here's what Paul says in the book of Romans. He says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand, impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. God is way above us, folks. God is so big. And I don't mean that as a disrespectful thing to any of us. We are loved by him. We are his most prized possession. We are his. But man, is he way more than we'll ever understand or, or know. God is so big. He is outside of the things that we can understand or know. And sometimes that may feel intimidating or like something that distances us from God. From God. But I would argue, let's see it as a win. Let's see it as a beautiful thing that the God of the universe, the creator of all things, he's on our side. And he loves us more than anything, which means he's gonna have what's best, that we can trust God. That's what that is. Be okay with being in, in the unknown and not knowing. Trust God. Trust God that when there's things that you just can't figure out, pursue it, please. I'm not talking, don't be the person who's like, I just read one chapter. It didn't make any sense. Never again. You know what I mean? Like, that. nice try. No, 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 no. Get in it. Read it, study it, ask questions, dig into it, but also be okay with the, with the fact that you might come to a place of still, I don't know, Lord. This is one thing that I've tried, God, and you, maybe Holy Spirit, you haven't re revealed this to me on purpose for whatever reason, and maybe the reason is just simply because I wasn't created to know this thing or fully understand it. Help me to be okay, because when I'm okay with that, I'm trusting you, Jesus. Be okay with the unknown. Second thing, last thing, now matters. Your life right now matters. We get in these conversations and we're all focused on eternity. And for some of us, we're like, I'm worried about it. I'm concerned about it. Others of us, we're like, oh man, I'm just trying to get out of here. You know what I mean? Like, let's go, Lord. I want to go there now. It's another thing that Paul says in Philippians. He says, for to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful works for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Like, Paul, you're being boastful. I don't know. But what I do know is Paul's reminding us of something super important. Eternity is so valuable. And as individuals in our relationship with Jesus, here it is, that's it, right? Lord, I can't wait to spend eternity with you. But God didn't just make us for eternity. He made us for here and now. He's like, hey, there are people here and now. You may be in this right standing with the Lord, but it's not just about you. Think of those loved ones that we're concerned about. God's like, hey, maybe now's a good time to go plant some seeds. Maybe now's a good time to pick up the phone and call that person and begin to show them just in your character and your nature who Jesus is with the hope that one day they'll give their life to him. Now matters. God has work for us now. And we should see that not as, oh, it's just gonna be so long, but it's yes, praise God. Praise God that he is with me every step of the way. He's called me to do these things. And there are people with every breath, there are people who need to know Jesus. So God, I'm here because here matters. And one day I'll get to rest in eternity with you forever, complete, restored, totally healed. But until then, tell me what to do, Father. Amen. Amen. Church, can we stand up? We're gonna pray. And I just want to give you this encouragement too. If this whole conversation on eternity, if it's new to you, 
You're like, this is different to me. It's intimidating me, whatever. Please ask questions. We've got people in the back who would love to pray with you, talk with you about those things. Come see us. We would love to talk more about these things. But also, if this concept of eternity is one you've never thought of, and you're listening in, and maybe you've been trying to do things your way, life your own way, and you're realizing, hey, I, I have a lot of brokenness. I have a lot of these struggles. I've got sin in my life. I have all this stuff, and I'm realizing I can't change it. I'm realizing that I don't really make the difference. And pastor, you just told me that Jesus is the one who makes the difference. He's the one who come in and makes us completely restored. He gets rid of the things that we don't need and I'm ready for it. It's always available. As long as there's breath in your lungs every day, Jesus is waiting, pursuing. He has plans for your life. He wants to be in intimate relationship with you. It is never too late. You've never done too many wrongs. Today is a great opportunity because he's ready for you. We're gonna sing one more song we can worship, but I challenge you, I encourage you, enter into that presence with Jesus. Let him know where you're at and give him the chance to show you that he will never, ever let you down. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this place, God, for your house that we get to come together and learn and grow and talk and and worship you, Jesus. You are worthy of every breath. Lord, I pray right now that you you just help us, God as we have questions that go unanswered, God, as we have things in our mind that we're, we're trying to make sense of, God, to, to just trust you if an answer doesn't come like we hoped it would, God. But ultimately, we, we ask you to help us to trust you with our lives, Jesus, with our eternity, Lord, to choose your way above our own and know that you will never let us down, God, that your heart is to completely make us new, God, and turn us into the best version that we could ever be. We need you and we love you and we thank you for loving us. It's in your perfect and powerful name we all pray. And everybody said, amen.